So our objectives today are to talk a little bit about uh, the value proposition for improving access. Why do we want to do it? What do we um, get out of that process? We want to talk through the process for assessing your current demand and um, looking at what your current supply is and figuring out how to put those in balance. And then talk about some strategies for achieving that balance. What are the key things that we see in primary care that can move that lever? So there's two kind of sets of options. There's increasing your supply. And then there's making new types of supply, essentially, um, so that your patients have different ways to access you other than necessarily walking in and having an in-person visit. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Are there other things? Do you have a specific question about access that you want answered today or specific challenges that you are seeing? Either group? OK, so let's dig right in. Okay. So as we're talking about the value proposition for improving access, it's, it really does drive that triple aim of increased, increased quality, lower cost, inc improved patient satisfaction, and that in, improved vitality of the team, the, the physicians and the other members of the care team. And the last piece of what we generally talk about is the five part, a five part aim, which is the, the triple aim plus that fourth aim of uh, vitality, and then a, a thriving business model. So <clears throat> all, three, all five of those things come into play when you're improving or in, enhancing access in your practice. So continuity of care increases. That also drives up patient satisfaction. You improve your patient outcomes, um, and you lower all those things um, on the right that are really driven by those process improvements that you're going to make in the practice. The other thing that you can be mindful of is that by increasing access, you're going to lower, in a lot of cases, the utilization of the hospital, and you're going to lower um, readmissions, 30-day all-cause readmissions, and readmissions driven by ambulatory sensitive conditions. So when you're in a model where you're talking about shared savings, it's very important to consider. Um, on this graph, what we're looking at, across the bottom, what your consumers value. And it's low value to high value. And then on the next matrices, you're looking at the prevalence. How, how common is it? How many people are doing it? So in the bottom right-hand quadrant, those are the things that are going to be market differentiators. If you can seize upon those things, then that's going to set your practice apart. It's going to satisfy your patients and um, really be an, an, a great thing to add to how you're delivering care. As you can see, of the six things in that quadrant, four of them are related to access. So making same day and next day appointments available, um, providing weekend access, extended weekday access, and um, longer visit, visits. So of those four items, of the people in the room who are practicing, how many of you have same and next day appointments available? Great, and how long have you had those implemented? Forever? <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and how, um, how do you manage them? Do you let, you know, if a patient needs um, a physical and they need it today, will you see them or is it just certain types of appointments? Anybody? Anybody? Great. We have a call for same day appointments. Excellent. Great. That's awesome. It's for new, established, urgent, or routine You'll even see a new patient on the same day? If I need to, yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Great. And same for you all? Mm -hmm. Same thing? Great. What about Oshner? Uh, within the Oshner system, they have the same Okay. Excellent. And then um, weekend access. That's a little bit different. Who offers weekend appointments? I'm sorry. Weekend appointments? Weekend. No. No weekend. Is awesome. Awesome. When patients come into your urgent care, they, their patient record is available, even in your urgent care locations. That's great. great. So we're going to spend our time talking about are these five key components to improving access. And one is understanding your supply and demand. Um, if you have same-day appointments available and they're filling up, that's absolutely excellent. But if somebody called you today and they wanted you know, a, a follow-up after hospital discharge, you'll always be able to get them in same day. Have you, do you have any challenge with fulfilling same day appointment requests or any appointment types that are gonna be a longer wait?
Yes. Okay, that's great. And for you guys, this is the same thing, same exact thing. Okay, great, very good. Um, the next thing is um, <clears throat> calculating annual pro provider um, supply and demand. So that's more than just looking at a snapshot, looking at a week and identifying this is what it looks like as we're looking at our capacity for this week or this two week period. How does that play out over your entire year? What are your peaks and valleys and how do you plan for those contingencies? We're gonna talk about assessing your access performance and identifying some measures um, so that you can keep an eye on how well, how finely tuned your access machine is running. Um, and then identifying access gaps, specifically as, like you were saying, by physician, by location, where do you have extremely high demand and lower supply and how you, can you balance those things out so that you can um, provide to your patients that sense of continuity um, with a provider. And then, again, implementing strategies to actually improve access. Um, so the way we're going to look at this is how do you leverage five key tools in five weeks to jumpstart improving access in your practice? And so the introduction is talking about a practice profile. <clears throat> that's not necessarily a piece of paper that's these are the things in the practice profile, but that's really a root cause analysis. What does the landscape look like in our practice? Um, what are our challenges with access? Those, those key questions I was just asking you about. And how, um, what is the input from our staff, from our physicians, from our patients about how we are giving clients access and patients access to our care team? Um, after you finish that practice profile, you'll complete the demand tracker. What, what appointments do our patients want? When do they want them? Um, and you'll look at supply. So how many appointment types do we have for the physicians in our group? How many physicians, um, how many appointments does the physician have day to day? And does that match with the demand that our patients have for um, access to care? And then finally, looking at future capacity. <clears throat> Is that gonna fluctuate? Is it gonna increase or decrease? Do you have staffing changes on the horizon? Is flu season coming? You know, what does that look like moving forward um, over the next year? You're going to refine your tools and set your goals. So after you measure, you're going to look at what, what does that tell you? How, how am I going to figure out what the actual challenge is and how I'm going to go about solving that challenge? So patient feedback is a huge part of it. Um, do any of you have a patient and family or patient caregiver advisory council in place already to get you that feedback? I'm sorry. A patient and family advisory council? Excellent. And Dr. Levy, how frequently are you getting input from them? Um, well, since I know all these people really yes. constantly. Constantly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They come to um, our quarterly meetings, our Excellent. meetings uh -huh. uh, every quarter, but I see these people very frequently. One is a, a psychologist, and uh, one is an exercise trainer, okay. and one is patient. Excellent. But they're all patients. Uh -huh. So they advise on different kinds of things, how to incorporate what they know about into the practice. That's, a, that's awesome. That's really great. Um, and then, of course, just um, a patient experience survey is another way to gather this information and track it over time. Um, keep an eye on how your patients are perceiving the access that you're providing to them, to the, to the care team. Okay. Um, match your capacity and demand. You've got the two measures, how do they, they line up with each other, um, and then create additional capacity. And like I said, there's kind of two ways we're going to talk about it, increasing capacity. It's not just adding more appointments by adding another provider or physician. It's not, it's not just about that. There are other ways that you can enhance um, and increase your capacity, and we'll, we'll do a little bit of talking about that. Then five weeks onward, you're going to experience, experiment with new policies, new processes, and new ways to look at access. Now, some of the ways we're going to talk about are same-day access, open access, weekend access, evening access. And a lot of those things are things that you've already implemented or your patients have access to. So let's spend a little bit of time today brainstorming about 
what additional challenges, kind of like what I asked at the top of the meeting, what additional challenges with access do you have? And what are some strategies that we've seen um, in, in working with practices nationwide that could possibly help you in improving access? Um, Just another slide to kind of review what you cover um, when you're doing that practice profile. Um, again, your objective with this is to get a picture of current state in your practice. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig back in here again and I wanna ask a few more questions. When you're thinking about how you might go about doing this practice profile, what are the key roles in your practice? What are, who are those key people that you would wanna reach out to to ask them about potential access concerns <coughs> Um, at different sites, at different locations, who do you want to talk to? Who would have information about where there are gaps um, or challenges with access in your practice or in your system? Office staff? Yeah. Front desk, registration? Yeah, absolutely. Provider. They're going to know. <laughs> They're definitely going to know. And providers are going to hear took me too long to get in to see you, or I had to see that other person the last time that I wanted to see you. So definitely a very valuable um, source of information. Front desk or whoever's doing scheduling is going to know who's irritated, you know, who wanted to get in and couldn't, um, or the appointment type that they wanted, they had to wait longer than they felt they should. Um, so those are absolutely excellent places to look for this information. Any other roles in your practice or in your system that might have this information that you need to include in this practice profile process. Anybody have care managers or care coordinators who are working with patients? Yeah. They might be a good source as well. They're, I mean, the, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Levy's like, hey, this is, this is the person who has this information. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, care managers, care coordinators, um, if you have a case manager, you have integrated behavioral health, any of those people are going to have a trusting relationship with your patients and they might have insight into what the challenges are with access. Um, so all of those folks are people that you can reach out to and include in this practice profile process. The capacity and demand trackers, there are, are those tools included in this pack, the packet that everybody has, the full-sized presentation? If they're not, the CTCs can get this information to you, a full-page copy of the supply and demand tracker. There's kind of this same slide is inside of both your... Um, your participant guide and in the printout of the actual presentation. Um, but if you want this in Excel format, the CTCs can get that to you, okay? Great. But the demand tracker, again, as you're looking at it, it this is a pretty manual process. Whoever's um, scheduling your appointments is going to track for usually about a week period. Um, you want to include every day because, you know, Mondays and Fridays might be heavier, Wednesdays might be a heavier day for you. This is going to give you a view of what that trend is across the week. Um, but you're going to log how soon the patient wants to be seen, what appointment type. You might even add which provider they want to be seen by um, and then put down when they actually were able to be seen. And you'll track that and you'll track those trends over the week, and it'll um, give you a, a really clear view of where you have peaks and where you have some dips and what kind of appointment types you weren't able to fulfill as quickly as the patient wanted, okay? Any questions on that tool, how it might be useful? The other thing that I'd like to point out about this tool, again, as I said at the top, your CTC can help you with how to um, leverage this tool, um, how to use it, and thinking through a PDSA cycle or um, you know a rapid improvement project that would let you leverage um, the demand tracker, um, figure out how to work it into that workflow at the front desk so that it's not a huge detraction and scheduling appointments doesn't take twice as long for that week. Um, think through, you know, does every scheduler have this or do you just do it with one scheduler? Think through if you have centralized scheduling, how you handle that sort of thing and you're, you're just looking at one site, for instance. So the CTCs can help you with that. And again, Help Teamworks is here to, to help them as well. 
with, with um, thinking through some of those things. So, okay. um, we've touched on this a little bit, but this is the process of thinking through, I've got all this data. I know what the demand is, I know what my supply is, now what do I do with this? You know, how do I use this to really define a new approach to access and how to enhance access in the practice? And um, let's keep going through some more of these slides and talking through um, some alternative access options um, and different ways to, like I said, kind of create capacity that aren't just adding um, new schedule, new, um, new appointment slots. So there's eliminating backlog. The first, I mean, you probably already have, um, and we've talked about this, you've got some same day access available, you've got extended hours, you've got urgent care options. There might be some backlog that exists from before you implemented all those things that you need to work down, patient demand or need that is really driven usually by gaps in care. So that diabetic patient who hasn't been in as frequently as they need to get in, you know, patients with hypertension who need to come in more frequently than they have in the past, getting them on that regular cadence and working down the demand from, for those back appointments <coughs> is gonna put you in a better position moving forward to keep balanced access in your practice. Staggering provider schedules. It doesn't sound like Dr. Levy can do that. Yeah. <laughs> you do that? Yeah, oh, awesome. We each work four ten. Yeah, she okay. Great. That's I'm like Dr. That's one thing Dr. Levy can't do, but you can. That's awesome. That's really exciting. Do you at, at Oshner, do you do any staggered physician schedules um, at any of your sites? As you know of? Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Same. Same thing. Okay, great. Um, and then enable staff to work at top of license. You guys have heard this. Um, in all of the work that has, is going into transformation in healthcare, there's always the sense that we're kind of layering on. It's one more thing. Um, but as we take on new changes, we've got to, A, identify the value proposition. B, identify who on the care team should really be doing that, and then look at the activities that are being done by all the different roles in your practice and figure out who is best to be executing on something that's added new. You can't just say, you have a completely full-time job plus 10 hours a week already. Here's another thing for you to do. And it's all about finding those efficiencies. What are the things that um, can be done at the same time? What are the things that can be rolled into the same workflow or the same process? So it's not you know, picking up the phone and scheduling somebody and then going back to that demand tracker and writing down everything that you just did on that call. Is there a way to integrate completing that demand tracker while you're actually doing the scheduling in the system instead of making it a two-step process? And that's awesome, yeah. Um, it, it's just really about thinking about those efficiencies and where you can um, eliminate busy work, eliminate duplicate work, eliminate manual processes, how much can you automate, and um, that, that's not an easy thing. You know, it's not always just this week we're going to figure out how to um, get Susie working at top of license. <laughs> it's constant. As you add every new change that is introduced in your practice, you've got to rethink how the, that work balances um, out across the care team. Okay. And then reducing administrative workload. You've got to take as much of that administrative burden off of your physicians as possible and shift that in other places in the practice. And that's, we all know that that's harder, um, harder it's easier said than done. <laughs> but um, that's got to be a priority and you've got to identify the things that absolutely need the physician's eyes on it and the things that don't. So there's a couple of different ways that you can accomplish that. And I know that I probably sound like um, I'm just repeating the same messages over, over and over again, but your CTCs can help you with that and they'll be equipped with some tools that will help you look at the different things in your workflows, identify those things that um, are done by each role in your practice, and the, I'm sorry, and then identify of those things which things the physician shouldn't be doing. Um, and that can help quite a bit. It's so one of the activities that we're gonna do in the team-based care breakout later, which will be in the, the room next door. 
um, is talking through exactly that process, looking at some key items in workflow, who's doing them and how to readjust those. In the leadership session, kind of on the, the flip side, we'll be talking about how to empower your physicians to be really vocal and active in this transformation work so that you know um, and you have their voice at the table to influence those decisions about how administrative burden is um, manifesting itself in their daily work. Okay, All right. so. This um, slide speaks to itself. Um, our whole goal is to get supply and demand in equilibrium. We don't want more supply than we have demand, then you're losing money. You don't want more demand than you have supply, then you have unhappy patients who potentially can go elsewhere for care. Okay. Another strategy that we like to talk about um, when we're thinking about um, enhancing access and making more appointments increasing your patient's ability to access the appointments that you have available is uh, reducing scheduling complexity. So it's so a tricky question, um, but how many appointment types do you have in your clinic or clinics? What do you mean? Um, how many different types of appointments do you have that your schedulers have to keep straight? Mean like uh, routine? Uh, mm -hmm. Four, that's awesome, that's really great. Anybody else? Just in primary care. There's regular appointments, mm -hmm. there's new patients get mm -hmm. double time, mm -hmm. uh, high risk patients get double time, and annual wellness visits get double time. Okay, that's great. And there are a lot of different colors on the schedule. On the schedule, so when you look at the schedule, you know exactly what. I've got red people mm -hmm. on the schedule, I know those are high risk. High risk. Excellent. Anybody else? About how many different? Three. three. three? Great. Awesome. And how uh, do they all have the same amount of time? Are they 20s and 30s or? All EPs are 15. Mm -hmm. um, and the new patients could be 30 depending on the provider. That's great. That's great. Provider specific, but it's only 15 and 30. Yeah. No 20s and 40s. Yeah. So same thing. Right, that, that's excellent. When we usually, when we present this topic and we talk about reducing scheduling complexity, we hear 17, 20, um, and then appointment times that are like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, and they're all over the place. And then those appointment types are specific to different providers in a practice. And so the scheduler has to keep track of all that information. So you guys are ahead of the game there. That's, that's great to hear. And then we talked a little bit about this right at the top. You know, a lot of the different solutions that we talk about are extended hours, you know, um, staying open till 7, opening at 7 a.m. or staying open till 6 or 7 in the evening and adding those weekend visits. And you guys have that covered. Um, Dr. Levy, do you have an in, um, extended hours? I don't think I asked you that one. 5.30. 5.30. That, yeah. Yeah, that is extended. I mean, most offices close at five, so that absolutely is. And then advanced access, that's that um, same day access and um, balancing it so that you have the right number of same day appointments available. Um, again, I'm coming back to you, Dr. Levy. You shared that you, um, your same day appointments fill up just about every day. Do you remember? Always. Doesn't always. So what, what do you have, um, how do you plan for how many appointments you make available? How did you get to the number that you decided to leave open? Two in the morning, two in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. We, we found, um, we do not have the demand for the later hour appointments. Appointments. Uh, yeah, we cut it back to one day mm -hmm. because we just didn't have the demand. No one yeah. was coming and I can't pay staff to sit there. And that, that's, that is, that is absolutely one of the things that we see in a lot of practices. They'll extend hours. Um, so they'll make the practice stay open until 6 o'clock every day, and then they're sitting there and there's not a patient in the office. Yeah, they have to undo that. Exactly. I, I find they, they would prefer to come at 8 in the morning mm -hmm. before they go before to work. Before they go to work. Um, that's, part, that's something that you can bake into that demand um, 
uh, tracker. If nobody's looking for an appointment after five, then there's no reason to add an appointment after five. You know, you can also go to your patient um, and family or patient and caregiver advisory council and ask them that question. Because if, if you don't make appointments open, available after five o'clock, your patients probably won't ask for them. But if you ask your PFAC, what do you want to see? And maybe even do a short survey to get to that information before you extend. And it didn't work out. And that, that's what I see with a lot of practices. Just test it out and make sure that it's a, a short cycle change. You're not committing to a year. <laughs> Let's try this out for a while. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Do you have extended hours? We do have extended hours. Mm -hmm. We actually started with, um, we do 7.30, mm -hmm. um, currently right now 7.30 to 6, but we did start out at 7.30 to 7 and had the same thing. The, not didn't work. So we backed it back down, but yeah. we've been doing the 7.30 to 6 now for about two years. And it's... Um, and we have um, five days a week, so we do have um, capacity in the building pretty quickly. That's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. We see smaller practices doing like a care home type of other practices so that they are offering late hours, but not, you know, like if you want to come in after 6 or after 5. You know... Share. I haven't seen that, but I think that that is a great idea. What I've seen are small practices working with um, an urgent care partner or a telehealth partner. And I know that Blue offers a telehealth option as well <coughs> that patients can access 24-7 um, if they need care after, after hours. Dr. Lee, would you expand on that? Do you think doctors are going to be able Yeah. 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 Right. I just know doctors are going to miss Yeah. Right. I can tell you, doctors are not going to miss it. Would you refer to your patients? Would you refer a patient after hours to something like Blue Care for a telehealth visit? Okay. Maybe we can get some today. <laughs> yeah. It was only six months ago. <laughs> but actually, I asked, I was, uh, it's on my list for my meeting Friday for my office manager to find those brochures. That yeah. Was yeah. And if not, we will make the list ourselves of those clinics and hours. But they charge clinic rates. Yeah. So that's the right thing to do. Yeah, that's great. That's and really it's a great. small community. They can always get there. Yeah. Yeah, tell Dr. Hill, thank you, but <laughs> next time he tells me he's going to do something, please do it. <laughs> that's great. So, so these are... You know, I've been peppering you guys with questions this whole time. We've got a kind of a smaller audience. So, um, again, when we talk about what your teams have done to improve access, it sounds like you've implemented same-day access. You've done some extended access. You've um, done some QI around what works with extended access, and you've drawn in those times. Um, you've thought about how to refer your patients to other providers after hours so that they get the care that they and, need. And I would Yeah. That's awesome. We do do video visits currently right now in our okay. pediatric practice. Uh -huh. just enhanced access, and we're getting ready to bring that to our adults in June. So that's awesome. That's another avenue. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. That's what we would do later, too. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I don't have a lot. <laughs> how, do you, how are you communicating all of the um, routes for access that you have to your patients? Is it your website? Is it brochures? Is what are the tools that you use to communicate to your patients currently about access, access in your practice? All new patients get a packet mm -hmm. with all the hours, and then we have them posted in okay. the office. Okay, great. Because they change too yeah. sometimes. And Fluctuate. I believe they're on our portal. Mm -hmm. Same thing? Yeah. Patient. Portal stuff, stuff on yeah. our inside of our offices. Uh -huh. That's really great. That's great. 
So as we're thinking a little bit about this, I do want to just take a minute because we're, we're like way ahead of schedule in this session. I want to talk about contingency planning a little bit. How do you, how do you modify your access for, let's say, flu season? when you know that there'll be a far greater demand for those acute visits, they don't necessarily need to see their PCP. How do you address that? So, so we adjust the same days. You okay. know, so we very well might have in the slower season two and two, mm -hmm. but in the flu season we may have, you know, eight. Yeah. So do you, um, do you adjust the, the number and the time of those? Or do, are they still the same we length of appointment? More, we would mm -hmm. add more holds. Okay. Add more holds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And you all respond yeah, to the season? Within OHS, they have some that get held uh, on the side, but I actually want to get to overwhelming. There are times where uh, they just basically the entire system said, if somebody calls out, they have the right to take a single or whatever else. But the Oshner Rally does, so it's like cost medicine or food. Yeah. So you do, a, you do a, a, a protocol, mm -hmm. yeah. basically. That's excellent. That's really excellent. And that's one of those ways to increase access without adding appointments, um, de devising standard protocols um, and making sure that the care team members are working within the scope of license but applying those protocols as, as necessary. Um, anything that we've talked about today that you're going to bring? You guys are doing everything. So you guys are kind of the tough class. But anything that you're going to bring back to your practice, anything that you're going to think about um, doing with your, your teams? related to access. Well, that's what I was saying. I mean, so I've been answering on behalf of Boston Health System. So yeah. The system. We yeah. have our network. Uh -huh. There's a lot of independent practices within that. So, yeah. I mean, so we're going to go and take this information to those sort of practices that we know have access issues and mm -hmm. what that means for them. That's great. That's great. And I mean, again, if you've got specific access questions, that demand tracker, the supply tracker, um, working through that practice profile is going to get you to the root cause. And, you know, then there are strategies that can, can pinpoint it. Not every practice has to go advanced access and same day appointments and extended access. And, you know, there are very specific targeted responses. For those small independent practices, you can't do everything. You can't boil the ocean. So finding the specific solution that's going to address their need is really important. So I hope you guys are going to leverage the CTCs to support you in that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I've like been like this all time because I'm pointing at the camera and you guys are over here. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Um, I think this tool is really helpful uh -huh. to track where our needs are yeah. um, and opportunities. But I'm curious, are there any sort of standards or benchmarks that you'd offer for commercial populations or maybe age groups related to access? Yeah, so that that's a tricky question. Um, and there's multiple steps to it. So one of the things that we didn't really talk about in here, because we were just talking about getting to supply and demand and like setting the stage, um, is looking at risk stratification and looking at the specific care needs across your patient population. And risk stratification doesn't necessarily have to <laughs> define or give you a framework for your sickest patients. It can also give you a framework for your healthier patients, how frequently they should they be getting in to the practice based on their, um, you know, their age, their gender. Um, and what you can do with that is... <sighs> There's like, there's like five steps to this process. So you're looking at the care needs across your entire patient population. You're going to group your patient population based on age, gender, and that risk level, right? Then you're going to generalize how many visits each of those tiers should have in a year. Look at the percentage of your patient population that falls into each, and then flesh that out into your total panel, um, and then the total number of visits that are needed, and then spread that out across all your physicians, right? Um, then that gives you a better idea of what that true demand is over the entire year based on, the, you know, the age and the acuity of your full patient population. Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a really, that's that kind of idea of looking at what your access needs are across the entire year. And it's not looking at specific calls that you have from patients for what they need. 
it is looking at based on what you know about standards of care and what your standards of care are for different ages and um, genders and health status, how frequently your patients really should be getting in. And if you're meeting that, you would close every single gap in care that you have across all your patient population. That's another way to look at it. Um, and I think it's a really valid way to look at it. That also sets you up to really be able to do panel management across your providers and physicians. So you can see, you know, this provider's patient profile is composed of patients that are this age, this gender, this percentage at this risk level. And so this many visits are needed to, su to support the panel that's assigned to that doctor or that provider. And this is the number of visits that they actually have. So should we close this panel? Should we shift some of these patients to other doctors? Should we find ways to address some of these care needs through group visits or telehealth or nurse visits? Like how can we be creative to satisfy the needs of this panel? Um, and again, getting through that entire process is something that your CTCs can help coach you through from beginning to end um, as you're looking at the challenges related to access. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You can help us segment it and figure out what are the right rates. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? You guys have been great. Really great. Thank you so much. I um, I really, I, it's, it's exciting to me to be in the room with folks who are doing creative things with access um, to make sure that your patients can see you. It's also exciting to have like network and independent, pra uh, independent physician, um, you know, and different mixes in the room to talk about, you know, different strategies and to see that some of the same strategies work, whether you're big or little. Um, Less time to do it in person than to try to deal with it over the phone. Yeah. Just come on in. Mm hmm. Come on in. Do it. Yeah. And get them, yeah. get them taken care of. Yeah. And you end up with a very happy patient <laughs> when you're able to do that. And so. I, I get home at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't like to call things in. I didn't say you did. They sure want it, but they're not going to get it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. I, I don't like to treat over the telephone. Yeah. So I'd rather see them. And mm -hmm. you have to educate the patient. Yeah. Another thing we didn't talk about mm -hmm. that comes up that happened today is chronic no show. Because that oh. messes up your schedule. Yeah. And I'm trying to limit my practice world uh -huh. because I'm old. I don't need to grow anymore. Yeah. But um, if, and if so, if a new patient doesn't show up, uh -huh. that's not a good thing. That's the spot. Yeah. You know, and, and we can't charge them. Yeah. So. <coughs> Blue Cross Blue Shield will be launching an access clinical play very shortly. Um, it will be hosted online. And one of the pro parts of the access clinical play is addressing chronic no-shows. Um, how do you... Consider things like a modified wave schedule, for instance, as just one example. When you know your patient is a no-show, how can you flag that in your EMR or in your scheduling system so when that patient calls in, you'll double book them? You know, it's a 50% chance they're not going to show up. <laughs> so hedge your bet. <laughs> um, so those are some of the strategies um, and some of the ways. Yeah, you do. You really do. Yeah. It becomes a liability um, in, in terms of. I don't like to do that. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. <coughs> I hear you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Is, is it, are any of y'all doing um, group visits for certain chronic mm -hmm. Do you have implemented that in your. I try, but I couldn't get paid. Yeah. Getting paid for that is difficult. Mm -hmm. I try to get behavioral health uh -huh. through CMS, the codes. Yeah. Uh, we were uh, coaching and Mm -hmm. properly and that was another thing. Yeah. It was taking time and mm -hmm. um, we just weren't getting reimbursed. Yeah. Now I can't advise directly on coding, but how did you structure your group visits? Oh the coding was done right. Yeah, I know. I'm yeah. So I'm just I'm thinking Yeah, we yeah. had a, a you know, a certain schedule for those behavioral health patients. Uh -huh. I had a third part time nurse practitioner at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That was doing those. And, mm -hmm. um, just wasn't. Pay. Yeah. So and it was it's a good zero idea, net game. Uh, yeah. Did you see a, a value in patients improving? You know, is it there? We clinical metrics and we, well, we incorporated it with um, an ideal protein plan that we were doing that we discontinued. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was working great, mm -hmm. but it, it's I don't like providing something for some patients that aren't all my patients can't, can't get to. And yeah. But I think that's a good idea. When it first came out, I got mm -hmm. all the codes from CMS mm -hmm. and how to do it. Well, what CMS <laughs> had on their website wasn't how they paid. That's not how it planned out. Gotcha. And so after six months, mm -hmm. we had to figure out, well, no, you can't. They tell you to put the BMI first, uh -huh. but they won't pay you if you put the BMI first. But gotcha. you don't find out for three months because you're not going to pay. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Do you take patients from Kansas City? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you that all. That happens a lot. We yeah. have physical therapy in the office. Mm -hmm. I have a gym in my office, and mm -hmm. I have a physical therapist that would see just my patient mm -hmm. from one of the local therapy groups. Yeah. And we just couldn't get paid. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. such a great idea. The patients loved it. They mm -hmm. would do it because it was in my office, mm -hmm. you know, and they wouldn't have to be embarrassed if they would be a girl or whatever. Yeah. But it didn't work out. No. Lose yeah. Uh, if it's a good thing for patients, I can break even, but I can't. Can't lose the money on it. Right. So I thank you guys for coming. I'm going to uh, break now.